Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Bennett. In today's world, Mormonism is seen as a predominantly white church. In Joseph Smith's day, it was perceived as just the opposite. Mormons were considered so different back then that many scientists and doctors thought a new race was coming out of the Great Basin Kingdom. How did outsiders get such strange ideas? Paul Reeve, professor of history at the University of Utah, will help us answer that question. Let's listen into our conversation. Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm, I'm Rick Bennett. I'm here with uh, historian and author Paul Reeve here at the University of Utah. I appreciate you uh, allowing us to, to come and talk to you here today, Paul. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. So, uh, Paul is the author of a book, uh, Religion of a Different Color. Wanted to talk a little bit about the book, first of all. But before I do that, just wondering, do you have any other books in the works right now? Uh, I'm, I'm working on a documentary history of the 1852 Utah Territorial Legislature. Oh. Uh, so it's the legislature that uh, Brigham Young speaks to, and it's the first known articulation by a prophet president of the LDS Church of a race-based priesthood restriction, and uh, it's within that context of the legislative debates taking place. Um, so uh, working with Lejean Carruth, who has transcribed the speeches from that legislative session from their original Pittman shorthand. Some of them had never been transcribed since 1852. And um, Christopher Rich, who is a legal scholar. Uh, So the three of us are working on a documentary history of that legislative session. Well, that's exciting because I actually wanted to talk to you about that uh, today as well. So we'll go into a little bit more, more history there. I did not know that. That's, that's exciting. So, Paul, you are a, let's see, as I recall, you had a recent promotion. That's right. So, can you tell us about that? So, I was promoted from associate professor to full professor uh, this academic year, so July 2016. Okay. Um, so, three levels of professors. Most people aren't aware, but three levels of professors in, in academia, uh, assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. So. I was promoted to full professor. All right, and you're also the director of graduate studies, I understand. That's correct. So that's a pretty, pretty time-consuming thing right now? It is time-consuming. Uh, we're in the middle of the admissions process, and so uh, we get to decide who gets admitted and who doesn't, as well as financial aid, and um, just kind of generally keeping track of graduate students. Yeah, well, I understand. I really appreciate you taking some time out for that. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about your book. Um, so. Uh, Religion of a Different Color, uh, it's a kind of an interesting uh, take on that. Uh, kind of the premise of the book, as I understand it, although correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, Mormons were once too white, and now we're not white enough. So I kind of like to talk a little bit about the evolution of that. Um, I mean, can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So just, just to be clear, um, the exact opposite of what oh. you said. Not white enough in the 19th century, <laughs> and then by the 21st century, too white. Yes. Uh, so that's the basic arc of the trajectory of the argument for, for the book. So in the 19th century, um, Mormonism was actually born into a very charged racial context, and uh, <clears throat> even immigrants from Northern and Western Europe were being racialized as not fully white. Uh, so. There was a racial hierarchy that animated 19th century thought about where people fit in, and Anglo-Saxons were at the top of that hierarchy, and then uh, like Irish immigrants or Italian immigrants were seen as less than fully white, somewhere down that racial ladder, and then obviously you have Native Americans, Asians, um, African Americans uh, at the bottom of the racial ladder. And 19th century observers were trying to figure out where to situate Mormons. Uh, So the argument of the book is that they weren't merely religiously suspect, but also racially suspect. So you had medical doctors who uh, actually argued that Mormonism, Mormon polygamy in particular, was giving rise to a new race, a degraded, sunken, degenerate race. Uh, and therefore Mormons in their bodies were um, denigrated as not white. And really, if you take the uh, argument to the extent that it's taken in the 19th century, um, what's at stake in the minds of outside observers is American democracy. Because John C. Calhoun says on the floor of the United States Senate, democracy is the government of a white race. 
And the fear was that in practicing polygamy, as well as giving their free will over to the despots Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, as outsiders viewed it, then Mormons were actually uh, reverting away from civilization, backward into barbarism, and into savagery. And therefore, democracy is at stake. Hmm. I think that's a, a kind of a strange thing for us to think about, that Italians were a different race, or Europeans were a different race. Um, how, I mean, how did they come about these ideas? Yeah, well, I, um, <clears throat> that's a really good question, and I think that's what's really important to keep in mind, is that uh, it's a very fluid and illogical racial context in the 19th century. Uh, so you have a variety of different thinkers kind of suggesting ideas about what race means. And in the 19th century, um, nation also could equal race. So the Irish race was commonly referred to in the 19th century. Celts, uh, you know, different, what we would consider ethnic groups today were considered different racial groups. Uh, and thinkers in the 19th century are simply trying to make sense of these various groups of people and try to create a racial hierarchy. And in their minds, whiteness equals freedom, blackness equals slavery, and then you have this gradation uh, in between. And where do you situate everyone else? And that helps you to determine how they're treated. Access to political, social, and economic power are bound up in where you're situated on this racial hierarchy. And so when Mormons, uh, <clears throat> the racialization for Mormons starts before they are openly practicing polygamy, but polygamy gives, gives it simply a new life. And especially after Mormons openly practice polygamy, um, the argument is that we have this fearful decline away from civilization backwards into barbarism. So the development theory is in operation in the 19th century. Uh, it simply <coughs> posited that all societies go through three basic phases. They develop from savagery into barbarism, and then from barbarism into civilization. And once you arrive at civilization, um, you have shed the markers of barbarism or savagery, and a couple of those markers were polygamy and adherence to despotic rule. And with the Mormons, the fear was these are people who might look white, right, but they're not behaving in the way that white people are supposed to behave. They are practicing polygamy and giving their free will over to despots, and therefore the fear was you have this slippage backwards from civilization back into barbarism and in, into savagery. So it seems like they're kind of combining kind of sociology with race uh, yes. and creating, creating a kind of a, a strange definition. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, I mean, people are sort of just casting about trying to figure out what it means to be white or less than white, what it means to be black, what it means to be Native American. Uh, religious thinkers had uh, long looked to the Bible to try to understand where the races came from, and they would look to Noah's sons after the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and argue that those three sons give rise to Europeans, uh, Africans, and Asians, like three major groups. But um, you have uh, what we would consider pseudoscientists today, but in the 19th century, people who are arguing that, in fact, uh, there was more than one genesis or more than one origin, that the races were so distinct, black and white were so distinct, that there must have been separate species. It's called the polygenesis theory, more than one genesis. Um, religious thinkers rejected it because they saw it as an attack against the Bible. The Bible only talks about one creation, and the polygenesis theory suggests there must have been more than one creation giving rise to separate races that were so distinct that they uh, were different species. Um, so religious thinkers rejected that because they said it attacks the Bible. So Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, for example, rejected um, the argument of the polygenesis. They said that we all come from one origin, right? But then, um, especially with Brigham Young, he'll start to argue that how do you account for blackness? Well, he uses the curse of Cain in the Bible that predates even the founding of Mormonism by a thousand years. That's 
part of the broader Judeo-Christian tradition that's traceable to uh, the Old Testament. Okay, well that actually, uh, brings up a few questions. So as far as, so Brigham Young, I, so he, go, he, he pushes it back instead of the curse of Ham, he pushes it a thousand years beyond to the curse of Cain. Um, wow, I hadn't realized that, that that's kind of an interesting, so that's, that's kind of a development that Brigham Young did that most Protestants didn't do. They would have just referred to the curse of Ham. Well, um, both of them are in operation. So the curse of Cain predates Mormonism as well. So that's, um, so um, Genesis says God put a mark on, on Cain and his descendants. And um, the idea that that mark was black skin um, predates Mormonism by a, a thousand years. Like the earliest sort of references are um, Jewish scribes, uh, and it becomes a part of the broader Judeo-Christian tradition that's passed down um, in the West over, you know, uh, almost a thousand years, uh, and it's in existence before Mormonism is even founded. There's a black slave, uh, I think he's writing in 1828 or 29, he writes a narrative, uh, and he says, you know, white people um, are just ready to tell me that I am the descendant of Cain, and I'm cursed. Um, and that's, you know, a couple of years before Mormonism is founded in 1830. So, oh, wow. um, and like I said, um, there have been some studies of those notions in the broader Ju Judeo-Christian tradition, um, looking way back in um, the European history, um, sort of the Jewish glosses on, on the Bible, and they are the ones who are suggesting that the mark that God put on uh, Cain and his descendants was black skin. And so it becomes a part of this broader Christian, hmm. Judeo-Christian tradition that Brigham Young and Joseph Smith would have been immersed in. Um, uh, Joseph Smith does talk about the curse of Ham, but it is really Brigham Young that gives life to the curse of Cain and associates it with a priesthood restriction. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Wanted to uh, just loop back around and talk a little bit about this polygenesis theory. Um, that was kind of interesting to me. So, going back to that, essentially they were saying there was a white Adam and Eve, a black Adam and Eve, an Asian Adam and Eve, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, where would they get the Irish Adam and Eve? Or, you know, some of these uh, these other race things don't really make a lot of sense. Right? Yeah, they hadn't fully kind of worked that out. And sort of the polygenesis group, uh, mostly um, black versus white. Right, um, but suggesting that the races are so distinct that there must have been separate origins, separate creations. Um, you know, um, it's just simply their effort at trying to account for the distinction between the races. Um, and like I said, uh, religious thinkers reject it because they see it as an attack on the Bible and the creation narrative in the Bible. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. So I remember in one of your uh, presentations at the Mormon History Association, you talked about some pseudosciences, physiognomy, I think, where you could look at a Mormon and he had beady eyes and you could know that he was a Mormon or something like that. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, physiognomy as well as phrenology um, are two pseudosciences in the 19th century. and. Uh, both of them turn their attention to the Mormons. Um, so physiognomy is, is uh, this notion that you can read a person's character traits through his or her face. Um, and one of the ways in which they attempted to read the Mormon face was through the eyes. They said, um, they actually used an illustration of Brigham Young to suggest that he had polyerotic eyes versus um, Margaret Fuller Ossley, who is a 19th century uh, feminist who um, was so devoted, the story goes, to her lover that um, when their ship sinks, uh, she had a chance to save herself but would rather drown with her lover than um, live without him. So that's the d um, example of monoerotic eyes. So the illustration in the book is um, of her eyes in comparison to Brigham Young's eyes, and she had really wide, round eyes uh, like a dove that mates for life. Brigham Young had eyes, um, at least in the depiction, right? It's just an artist drawing, but has eyes that are very um, narrow and kind of closed, and those were deemed polyerotic eyes, similar to a hog which mates with whoever it wants to. Um, and so those were the ways in which there was an effort at reading Mormon faces. 
Uh, and then phrenologists also um, kind of played up uh, the distinctions amongst Mormons. Um, Br Joseph Smith had his uh, school read by phrenologists and other Mormon leaders did as well. And the suggestion was that there's something distinct that sets Mormons apart. Um, mm. It's physical, not just religious, in other words, right? Um, and it's really by the 1840s that outsiders are referring to a Mormon race. And you have medical doctors who visit Utah Territory who suggest that there is a new race um, emerging out of the Great Basin. There's actually a conference held at the New Orleans Academy of Sciences in 1860 uh, where uh, they actually, medical doctors gather and they have a conference about the supposed new race that's emerging in the Great Basin. All the doctors present at the conference by the argument and actually push it, push it forward except for one. One doctor argues against that. He simply says, look, it's only been 30 years since this religion has been around. We should really um, engage in an empirical study for 30 more years before we can conclusively say that Mormonism is giving rise to a new race. Everyone else just simply said, yeah, polygamy, uh, because it's degraded, uh, is producing degraded offspring and therefore um, a new race is emerging in the Great Basin. They actually argue that um, Mormonism would solve itself if we, the United States could stem the tide of outside converts, converts from Europe, that it would produce a uh, sterility in the next generation because it's degraded, um, the next generation, uh, within a few generations, the men are gonna become sterile and it will die out of its own force if they could simply stop immigrants from coming in from Europe and bringing new blood in. Um, that would perpetuate the problem much further into the future. Wow. Yeah. These are some strange ideas. <laughs> they are very strange ideas. It makes you wonder whether there are strange ideas that in a hundred years people go, I can't believe they thought that. Exactly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have heard uh, uh, the thought that, you know, there are some people that say, well, you know, black, white DNA, it's 96 or 98 percent exactly the same, and race is a, race should be a sociological term. Even today they say that instead of a, uh, 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 you know, say there's some sort of a physical difference. I mean, yeah, you've got black skin, white skin, I guess yellow skin in, in, with Asians. But um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Is, is that something that we should, we should just do away with race declarations altogether? Or, or what do you think? Well, I, I think um, one of the conclusions for the book is, right, if you can racialize Mormons, then you can racialize anyone. Um, and it really points to the fact that race is not a biological reality. It's a social construct. So in other words, we've used it in society to differentiate between different groups, right? And it's important just to simply understand that. I don't know that we'll ever get rid of its sociological function, but it's important to understand that it's not a biological reality, like you mentioned, right? Like the bulk of our DNA is actually uh, the same. Uh, uh, black people have more melanin in their skin end of story. That's it, right? And um, from DNA studies, we actually all are Africans. I mean, that's one of the conclusions that DNA has taught us is that origin of man comes from Africa. Um, and so really we all start um, from Africa and, you know, it's, it's sort of evolutionary biology after that in terms of where people spread and exposure to the sun, um, lighter skin versus darker skin. Um, and so any notion that there is a bio biological distinction is, is, is completely false. It, race just functions um, as a social construct. And I think the book sort of bears that out. If white people, people who are predominantly white, um, like Mormons in the 19th century, can be viewed or constructed, imagined as a completely different race, it just points to the lie of race as anything but a social construct. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. I actually uh, have a master's degree in statistics uh, from here from the University of Utah, a Yay. Utah man I am. Yes. <laughs> so um, 
you know, in some of my epidemiology classes that I've had, they've said that there, there are always three variables you should always consider in any study, um, sex, race, and age. Um, because generally there are differences between, between all three of those. You know, older people are different than younger people, men, or women, men are different than women, and, uh, and we always include race. There, all, there does seem to be some issues, uh, with, and I don't know if those are sociological or physical, um, you know, for example, uh, uh, blacks uh, generally do not survive heart attacks as well as whites. Now, the question is why? Is there something biological about blacks that that is the case? Or is it more an issue of blacks have worse insurance? And it's more of, race is more of a placeholder for economic status. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of interesting, because um, I don't know that anybody's ever been able to answer that, but uh, from an epidemiological point of view, we always want to keep that in there because it, it, it means something. Sure. Whether it's biological or sociological or economic, you know, that, that's subject to debate. But, but that's something that's very important, I know, in medical studies. So. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I, when I talk about it as, as a social construct, right, um, um, talking about it as the way in which it functions in society in terms of um, access to political, social, economic power. Um, and in those ways, right, it's the way that we have constructed, um, you're not worthy of citizenship in the United States because your skin color is different than mine. The very first Congress, um, 1890, establishes conditions for w how you can naturalize as a citizen, and you have to be free and white. That's a social construct regarding race, right, that somehow um, people who are less than white are incapable of democracy. That's the argument that Congress is making. It's the argu argument that the Supreme Court makes. In those kind of ways, race is functioning to distinguish between white and black and actually elevate white over black uh, and disadvantage one group over the other only out of the social construct, not out of any biological fact that black people are incapable of democracy. Thank you for listening to our conversation. We hope you'll come back and listen to part two as we talk with Paul Reeve. Slavery was a really divisive issue, not just for Mormons, but for Baptists and Presbyterians as well, who split along the issue. Joseph Smith actually stakes out um, a really open kind of perspective in terms of who's allowed within Mormonism and to become a preacher within Mormonism. You have the Methodists, the uh, Presbyterians, and the Baptists will either split or experience schisms over those questions. Mormonism actually allows white slaveholders and black slaves to be baptized and into their religious kingdom. Abolitionists and anti-abolitionists, they are casting a wide net uh, in terms of who they are accepting within the bounds of Mormonism. It's a fascinating discussion and I hope you'll join us for part two of our conversation. Please support our podcast by purchasing a transcript for just $3 at Amazon.com or here on our website, GospelTangents.com. We'd also love a review on iTunes so more people can find us. Also, please share this podcast on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube to help other people learn more about it. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll continue to support us here at Gospel Tangents.